So we have just one more minute uh, before the top of the hour. So I'm just gonna wait one more minute before we get started. So thank you for being here. And it is six o'clock and I wanna thank you all for being here for the Tennessee and Oneida Stormwater Project Public Meeting. Uh, my name is Vanita Curry and I'm gonna be your moderator tonight. Uh, Matt, if you could go ahead and share your screen. We've got a lot of information that we wanna share with you tonight about this project. Uh, and so we're gonna just kind of jump right into it. If we go to the next slide, You'll see that our goal is to give you a project overview uh, to talk about what benefits are going to arrive because of this project. We'll walk you through the construction plans and what kind of travel impacts they may have uh, along the construction site. And then we're gonna walk you through the timeline of what's gonna happen and when, jump into your Q&A questions and then uh, leave you with information on how you can contact the project team after tonight's public meeting. Uh, before I go any further, I wanna recognize Councilman Cashman's office and thank them for their support in publicizing uh, this public meeting uh, and for joining us tonight. So thank you so much. On our next slide. Just wanna go over uh, a few reminders. First off, as I said earlier, this meeting is being recorded. So if you know of any neighbors, family, friends um, who could not make it tonight, please let them know that this recording will be on the project webpage for them to view at their leisure. Um, our goal tonight is to answer your questions. And so there are two ways we want you to do that. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that chat box op option. Uh, at any time during the presentation, please go ahead and submit your questions uh, to the project team and then we're gonna answer those questions um, during our Q&A session. Uh, when we get to our Q&A session, uh, you can raise your hand to ask your question directly to the project team. So those are two options we want you to please take advantage of. On our next slide, I wanna introduce you to our project team. And so tonight we've got Brian Hoover, who is the project manager. We've got assistant project manager, Matt Ferris, our project inspector is Vu Trung. The construction lead uh, with BT Construction is Craig Wilkins. And so I wanna hand it off now to Brian to kind of give us an overview of the project. Brian. Okay, thank you, Vanita. Um, basically the reason that we are doing this project is the city has identified a, an area of flooding that occurs in the Tennessee and Oneida, Leedsdale and Oneida area. There's a shopping center there. And so ultimately we're trying to alleviate damage to property and, uh, and risk to safety in that area in the event of a large flood, a uh, large storm event. But we build these things from the downstream up. So what we're gonna do to, in this phase is just where the system is gonna daylight into the Cherry Creek, um, we're going to run two large pipes from Lollipop Lake daylight out into Cherry Creek and then start building the system from Lollipop Lake back up, lay pipe up into Kearney Street, go north on Kearney and then uh, head east at Mississippi for about half a block and then basically just put a plug in the pipe and that's the end of phase one. Uh, then phase two, when that gets underway, we'll just tie on to where we stopped at phase one. But phase one is basically just the area around Garland Park. Um, and we are putting in a large water quality vault too, to help clean the water before it goes into Lollipop Lake and then ultimately into um, the Cherry Creek waterway. So that's kind of an overview of why we're doing it and where we're gonna be working. Basically it's uh, Cherry Creek Drive North, Kearney, Mississippi, uh, that whole part of town. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the benefits to this project, like I mentioned, ultimately we're going to be relieving flooding risks up at um, what we call a sump, an area that is known to flood during large storm events. Um, and ultimately, you know, when we 
decrease the risk of flood. We increase uh, safety for pedestrians and cars driving through a major storm event. Basically, we're just trying to convey all of this big storm water event uh, into a system of pipes under the street and then safely into Lollipop Lake and ultimately into the Cherry Creek. Um, and then another benefit, like I mentioned before, this water quality vault that we're going to be putting underground under Kearney Street um, will take all of this um, runoff from a major storm event that runs down the flow line of the curb and gutter, runs across parking lots, picks up sediment, picks up, you know, motor oil, antifreeze, any kind of pollutant or um, debris. And instead of putting that into Lollipop Lake and ultimately into Cherry Creek, it will be capturing it in this vault that our operations crew can go out and use a vacuum truck and clean out periodically and basically increase the water quality that we discharge into uh, the major waterway of the Denver area. So those are the project benefits. Um, I'd like to hand it off to Craig now to get a little, little bit more into the nitty gritty of what this phase one is gonna look like. Craig? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Brian. Um, so as Brian mentioned, the water is generally flowing um, from the intersection of Mississippi and Kearney, at least on this phase, and down into Lollipop Lake. Um, what we're seeing on this slide is uh, kind of how we're reshaping the ground over there to receive that new water. Um, so this dark green is all earthworks. We'll be um, reshaping Lollipop Lake to extend northward a little bit. Um, and then this black line coming up from the north, that's going to be our eight by seven foot box culvert um, that'll be buried from there on out. Um, let's see. So you've got a, a couple renderings on here of, of what it should look like at the end of the day. Um, Matt, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and then on the downstream side, so we talked a little bit about everything that's dumping into Lollipop Lake um, on the south side of Lollipop Lake and just south of Cherry Creek Dive North is where that ultimately discharges into the Cherry Creek Waterway. Um, so another rendering that you see down here, um, you're seeing a, a double box culvert um, that'll be carrying the overflow water from Lollipop Lake into Cherry Creek. Um, so I know a lot of what the public sees on these are how we're closing the different roadways and bikeways. Um, so the next few slides are going to just concentrate on um, our impacts and kind of how the public is going to see um, some of this construction progressing. Um, the first major closure that we're going to have is on Cherry Creek Drive North. Um, there may be a couple smaller closures um, our first week or two on the job site, but we'll maintain access to traffic in both directions throughout those lane closures. Um, around the first week of December is when we plan to have a full closure in both directions. Um, so this purple segment of the road that we have highlighted will be closed and we'll be laying that um, double box culvert uh, across the roadway in an open trench. Um, around the same time frame is when we'll have uh, a smaller closure on the bike paths up in uh, Garland Park. Um, Another piece of this project that I suppose we haven't talk, talked about in too much detail is that we'll be rebuilding a lot of the bike paths around park, um, doing some landscaping inside of that bike path alongside the lake, um, and generally kind of beautifying the area. Um, so the purpose for pulling this particular bike path forward is that that'll be a, a primary reroute for um, our bike detours as construction progresses. Um, a second closure that we'll be adding up along with closure number one is uh, this other area up at the intersection of uh, Mississippi and Kearney. The intersection itself should stay open, but we'll be closing it down from um, just south of that intersection down to the parking lot ball field entrance. Um, and this is going to be a staging area for construction materials as they're coming and going throughout the job. Um, that closure will be a little bit longer. Um, so it was listed over there on the left, but we expect that to stay closed for the duration of the job. So approximately uh, December to May of next year. So 
So once we start the earthworks on the north side of the lake, um, if you recall, we'll be reshaping over on um, this east side, I suppose northeast side of the lake, um, doing mass earthworks and, and hauling out a lot of dirt. Um, as a part of that, we'll be demoing out um, all of these bike paths that you see with red X's through them. Um, just to maintain access through the park for bike traffic, um, we'll be sending people onto this dotted blue line. Um, so there'll be um, some kind of delineation on Kearney Street um, to, uh, to separate that bike lane from traffic um, and reroute them onto this newly paved um, concrete bike path um, that you see running east to west north of the closure. Um, so closure number three, this is where we'll need to close the intersection of Mississippi and Kearney. There will be a short closure of that intersection pretty early on in the job for a water line lowering, um, relocating it so that it's not in conflict with this new storm piping. Um, but then it'll be reopened again for a few months um, and then closed for approximately two months once our um, box culvert reaches that intersection. I'm looking at approximately April timeframe for that. Um, when we do have that intersection closed, there won't be any, um, well, I suppose there won't be athletic uh, ball field access for the duration of the job. That'll just be from the south end. Um, and then when we have the intersection itself closed is when we'll need to reroute some RTD bus traffic. Um, so instead of turning north on to Kearney, um, they'll be rerouted just one, uh, one street over to the east on Crane area instead. All right, I think this is our last bike closure. Um, we'll be working these two areas concurrently. So the, the earthworks over on the north side of the lake um, at the same time that we have our double box culvert that's um, extending from Cherry Creek um, over into Lollipop Lake on the south side. Um, so in that case, we'll have uh, all, of, all of these paths closed down um, and we'll continue to reroute that bike traffic over on Kearney Street. Um, so that's that's a fair bit of information. So uh, general construction sequencing here. Um, we'll be starting our first crew um, in the next week, week and a half now um, on Cherry Creek Drive North. Um, you'll see some minor construction activities over there before uh, we need to close down the road altogether. Um, looking for that full road closure around the first week of December. Um, in late December, or early January is when we're going to start a second crew on the north side of Lollipop Lake. Um, they'll, they'll start with the, the earthworks, so hauling out all that dirt to reshape the lake. Um, and then they'll start laying that box culvert up towards the intersection. Um, concurrent with a lot of this work is going to be um, some of our landscaping subcontract work. Um, so they'll be working their way around the perimeter of the lake inside of those bike paths. Um, removing um, the existing landscaping um, and planting a, a lot of native seeds that will be um, better suited for um, the fluctuating water levels of the lake. Um, ultimately looking at final completion of the job in um, late spring to early summer 2023. Um, and truck routes. So we're moving a lot of dirt on the job, either by um, removing it for trenching while we're laying box culvert or for some of the earthworks. Um, in either case, we'll have a, a substantial amount of trekking traffic coming in and out of the job site. Um, they'll be east and westbound on Cherry Creek Drive North, depending on which phase of the project we're in. Um, and then over on Kearney Street, we'll maintain that truck traffic um, primarily northbound. Um, and in all cases, they'll be heading to uh, uh, to dads to dispose of any excess materials. Um, we've also got a note on here about the vibration monitoring program. The bulk of this work is not particularly close to any um, residences, but obviously as we approach that intersection of Mississippi and Kearney Street, um, we'll be working right in, uh, right in front of the handful of houses over there at that intersection. 
Um, as we are approaching that area, we'll have uh, continuous vibration monitors plugged into the ground. Um, and those will give us uh, real-time feedback of what kind of vibration we're causing in the area. Um, we have a vibration consultant that we bring on board for this. So they'll, um, at the start of the job, come out and take some baseline readings, just see uh, what's a normal amount of vibration in the area based on um, generally traffic. There's not much other cause of vibration over here. Um, and then again, as, as we start construction, we'll get um, real-time feedback from our sensors of what kind of vibration we're causing in the area. And if it ever exceeds the established thresholds, um, which are recommended by our um, subcontractor, then they'll um, alert us and let us know that we need to, uh, to change our method somehow to, to minimize vibration. All right, uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of additional benefits that the public will get out of this project. Um, one of them is where our system discharges into Lollipop Lake, we're going to be creating kind of a nice little sitting area with an overlook where people could, you know, read a book or just enjoy a nice day out there, watch some of the wildlife in the pond. Um, there's going to be some picnic table, a picnic table and a couple benches and just like Craig had mentioned, kind of beautifying the area. Um, Another thing that we're going to do is from the, the walking path or the bike path that surrounds Lollipop Lake down to the water's edge, we're going to convert that area from like turf, from sod to some more native grasses and also regrade that area. If, if you've ever been over there recently, you know that as you get down to the water's edge, it's kind of like a two foot little cliff there where water has just eroded the bank uh, right at the water's edge and it's just kind of a drop off. So we're going to be reshaping, regrading from the water back up to the uh, that concrete path at more of a gentle four to one slope. Um, another thing that we're going to do is the the path around there right now. There's areas that are kind of just like a six foot wide uh, asphalt, old asphalt path. We're going to be upgrading that whole path system, that bike path, to. 10, uh, eight foot wide in some areas it tapers to 10 feet wide with a nice new concrete surface. Um, just, you know, upgrading the, the amenities there. And um, there's a, that path connects to Kearney at Mississippi. Currently that connection is not ADA compliant. It's a pretty steep asphalt path that just drops right off into Kearney. So we're gonna be bringing that connection up to um, compliant, compliancy with the Americans with Disability Act. And um, also we're gonna add a pollinator garden as part of this project, which will um, attract different insects that help spread uh, you know, pollen and help germinate the area. Again, making the park a nicer place to be. So um, I think those are some, some pretty cool benefits that the public will enjoy at the end of this project. Um, so with that, I will send it back to Vanita to do some Q&A. Thank you so much, Brian and Craig. Um, we have another team member um, that's joined us tonight, Brent uh, with Valerian, and, and they're leading the efforts around um, improvements for landscaping. And I just wanted to invite him to provide some more details about what kind of improvements you'll see while all, why I also ask you to please put in your questions. Um, is there, do you guys hear feedback? I do a little bit. Hold on one second. Um, I wanted to encourage you to please um, put in your questions into the chat box um, and be prepared to raise your hand uh, if, you, if you have any additional questions. But let me hand it over to, to Brent to please uh, walk us through some additional benefits around landscaping. Yeah, really, uh, Brian Brian really touched on most of the, of the items that we had planned for the park. Um, the one item I also wanted to touch on is the, the boulder work that we're adding um, to the outfall area. Um, it's going to be a, a really nice idea that you know, we could um, uh, interact with hopefully the, um, the native vegetation that we have going on there. Also a great spot that, you know, you can go and, and watch wildlife uh, birding 
but then also just a good spot to maybe go and read a book. Um, I'll touch on the, the trails around. Um, yeah, mostly um, making sure that we're buttoning up everything that we're touching as far as putting in the improvements um, with the project. Um, but then also, you know, adding improvements where, um, where we could um, in, in the project. That ADA accessibility on, on Kearney is, is a big, um, is a big uh, ad for sure. Um, the, the last item I want to talk about is the, um, the vegetation, the existing vegetation that's there now. Um, a lot of the trees we are, um, we are keeping, and um, it was, it was um, a part of our design to really work with uh, what was existing out on site and making sure we weren't impacting a lot of those. So a lot of those trees are, are remaining. I believe that we are taking out a couple of trees at the outfall near, um, near Cherry Creek, um, on the Cherry Creek side, but then also on the Lollipop Lake side, we are taking out a couple of ash trees, which are um, not as high value anymore just because of the ash borer. Um, and so what we are doing is instead of, um, instead of planting new ashes back, we are actually adding trees as a part of this project on the outfall um, throughout at Kearney, and then also um, near the outfall uh, on Cherry Creek to really kind of button that up and, and replace what we are um, removing and then and, and adding in some more. Um, there's also some wetland plantings along the, um, the shoreline as well to um, really hold back that water action that we've seen um, erode the, the shoreline. And so hopefully that vegetation will also um, uh, help to alleviate any of that issue um, going forward. Um, and then um, as we put in some of that vegetation as well, there will be um, goose protection out there. So I wanted to set that um, expectation. So we are trying to protect the vegetation that we're planting along the shoreline as well. Um, and uh, just know that that will be there until we can get establishment of that um, vegetation so that the geese don't uh, pull out all the plants that we're trying to put in there. Um, other than that, yeah, like I said, Ryan really touched on everything. That pollinator garden is really, like he said, to, to attract um, native insects and um, really provide a spot where um, people want to go and visit and, and um, again, look at, look at wildlife, look at the, uh, the insects that are, that are native to our area. So um, that's, that's really all I want to touch on. Thank you, uh, Manisha, for, uh, for allowing me to talk. Thanks so much, Brent. Really appreciate that. Um, I see that there are no questions in our chat box, um, but it looks like something just popped in. All right. Um, this is from Kelly Morrison. I've read that Denver Parks is uh, planting taller grasses around all of the lakes in the parks. It reduces the comfort level of the geese because they have a reduced view of predators. Is that the plan for Lollipop Lake? Uh, wouldn't mind fewer geese. <laughs> so uh, Brent, can you help answer that question from Kelly? I can, yes. Um, our mix uh, does include some taller grasses for sure, um, especially on that shoreline. Um, our idea, again, that those wetland species that we're planting in there will be a little bit taller. So the idea is to, to prevent um, as many geese as we can from, from eating all that grass and um, and really providing a buffer as well from the trail to the lake as well to try to give, um, you know, just that turf reduction and, and all of that. So, um, and really um, another part of that too is to really um, be cognizant of our water use in our parks. Um, that native grass will, will hopefully use less water and, and um, we'll be a little bit more conscious of our water use as we're going forward. Kelly, thank you for that great question and Brent for answering it. Um, we did reserve a lot of time for Q&A because we wanted to make sure everyone knew what to expect from this construction process. So please do use this time um, to answer your question either with the chat box or by raising your hand. I wanted to go back to Craig. Um, if you could just uh, provide a little more detail around the vibration monitoring um, I know that you've said that there are certain standards and thresholds uh, that you uh, and your team will follow 
Could you give a little more detail about what that looks like? Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a similar spec to what we typically see on city jobs. Um, so we as BT Construction are not, are not experts in this. We bring in a subcontractor um, and this is all that they do. Um, so they'll come in, um, take baseline readings for a few hours before any construction activities start just to establish what typical vibration is in the area. Um, beyond that, they rely primarily on historical data for what um, levels of vibration will cause um, any kind of impact. Um, so typically that's um, noticeable vibration, um, irritable vibration, and then once you start to see some kind of superficial damages, um, so that's maybe plaster or drywall is um, where you would typically see the, the first signs of some kind of damage. Um, and then the higher levels of, you know, what kind of vibration would it cause to, uh, to cause structural damage? Um, and based on that historical data, they establish thresholds for us um, that are really conservative. Um, they're about an order of magnitude lower than um, what would be needed to cause even superficial damage. Um, and then we get real-time feedback from that. So um, we get a... Uh, we have a warning threshold established, so that's a really pretty low number, um, and then a shutdown threshold where um, that's a little bit higher and says, um, you know, we need to shut down construction activities and reevaluate how um, we're going to be doing this. Um, on this project, just based on our, our shoring methods, I don't expect that we're going to see extremely high levels of vibration. Um, they'll probably be on par with um, what you'd see from a typical paving operation. Um, and I believe they do that every five to 10 years through the city anyway. Um, so we're we're not expecting that to be an issue on the job, but it is something that we keep a close eye on. Thank you, Craig. Um, mm -hmm. Next question I wanted to give to Brian. Can you just give a, a, a summary or a explanation as to why there has been localized flooding? I think you call it the sump area. Like what has created that historically um, for uh, flooding events? Um, I think generally what happens is that, you know, as you build an area, you pave it, you make the, the ground less permeable, um, the water's got to go somewhere. And since it can't soak into the ground, it, it pools and collects in the low-lying area. And the city's current, maybe, I don't know exactly if, if there is any um, underground system there or if just relying on surface drainage like through the curb and gutter system to finally get into the system somewhere. But basically, I think it's, I think it's just that the current system is undersized for, for the flooding that will, is projected to occur there. But I'm, I'm not really an expert on, on that kind of stuff. I would, I could maybe get back to you or talk to somebody who is an expert at it. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we do have another question from Kelly Morrison. What is the overall timeline for the finished drainage system from the sump area? When will Lollipop Lake begin to benefit from the fresh water flow? Craig, can um, you help us with that? Well, I think that Craig's really only gonna be able to talk to phase one. Um, phase two is where we, we tie on, like I had said, at Kearney in Mississippi and we lay pipe across Monaco. And then phase three, we would take it on from that point to the, to the flooding area. Um, and I can only be really general with you right now. Uh, I think phase two, where we, we pick up from where we leave off here is maybe a year to two years out from beginning construction. It's in a design phase right now. And um, I, I couldn't really guess about phase three. I, I think that's, uh, I don't know, five, five years out. I, I can reach out to our planning group and, and get back to you if, if you leave your contact info. But uh, that's, that's the best that I can give you right now. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, looking again at our chat box, I don't see any other questions or raised hands. So let's go to our, Next slide. 
where we want to make sure we leave you with information on how to stay in touch with us if you do have uh, future questions or concerns after tonight's presentation. We do have a hotline for you. So you can call our hotline at 720-460-9055, and a project team member will get back to you. You can go to our website, and that's going to be a place where we're going to provide updates as the project moves along, so you can see um, how the construction is progressing. So that website is at bit.ly forward slash 10 and Oneida, short for Tennessee and Oneida. And then lastly, um, please do sign up for our e-newsletter updates. Um, it is a, a real-time update that we provide whenever there's something new to let the public know about the construction process. And that uh, email address is ccd.constructionupdates, plural, at gmail.com. Or you can again text us at 720-460-9055. Well, you could have been anywhere else this evening and you chose to spend a little time with us tonight and we really appreciate you um, spending it with us. Uh, please do remember to let folks know that this uh, meeting has been recorded and they can view all the information that we shared tonight at their leisure. Until now, I mean, until later, have a great evening and thanks for joining us.